Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Attorney General Tom Horn faces fresh allegations of violating campaign laws. We'll discuss a new report showing the magnitude of state funding cuts to higher education in Arizona. And we'll check on an environmental report card for the state legislature. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. State Attorney General Tom Horn is facing a new round of alleged campaign violations. The latest involves claims that some employees in the AG's office were allowed to use state time and resources for Horn's re-election campaign. Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times is covering the story. Jeremy, good to have you here. Let's start with uh, Sarah Beatty. Who is Sarah Beatty? Uh, Sarah Beatty is a, <clears throat> a woman who worked in the constituent services department over at the attorney general's office from about August until a couple of weeks ago when she kind of suddenly resigned. She was also, in addition to her work at the AG's office, she was also doing some volunteer work with Tom Horn's reelection campaign. She's a fundraising consultant, much like a handful of other employees there, volunteering their, their, their time for the campaign. So, and, and she resigns, as you mentioned recently, uh, the reasons the office wasn't following campaign laws and was putting her career at risk, something along those lines? Yeah, it was pretty vague. She sent an email um, a few weeks ago saying that to her superior said, I'm resigning because the office is not following campaign laws and is putting my legal well-being at risk. She has not elaborated on that yet. She now uh, has an attorney and they're talking about uh, filing a, an official complaint with a lot of uh, other allegations. They actually submitted a letter to the AG's office a couple of days ago uh, from her attorney, Tom Ryan, kind of fleshing out a little bit of this, but most of it is still pretty vague, talking about um, employees doing, uh, using state time and state resources to work on Horn's campaign. There's one allegation about possible deleting of emails, but so far we don't know a lot of details yet. And again, this letter is one of these litigation hold demand things. <clears throat> What's that all about? Um, it's basically a demand, um, putting them on notice saying that you might, we might be suing here, so we want you to preserve all the pertinent documents, records, information. This includes not only paper documents, but electronic documents and uh, metadata, which is a uh, kind of electronic data about data. It shows that you know when you know when uh, like a document was created online for in, or on a computer, for example, when it was modified, who created it. They actually included one example of this as a f flyer for a Tom Horn fundraiser from I believe December of last year that was created uh, allegedly by uh, Brett Meekum, who's uh, Horn's uh, legislative liaison, uh, emailed out from a private email address by another uh, employee and uh, to several other employees, apparently. And the metadata shows this was during work hours. Okay. Uh, and back to Sarah Beatty real quickly now. Is, is she a Democrat? Is she, uh, is she pro Felicia Rodolini? Is she <laughs> not pro Horn? It sounded like she was at one time very supportive of Tom Horn. Uh, indeed it does. It does not sound like she's very supportive of him now, but she's been doing this work. But, you know, like I said, she's been doing this work for his campaign for a little while now, or volunteer work anyway. She is a, basically a Republican uh, campaign operative. She does a lot of fundraising, consulting. She's got uh, several other clients, PACs, stuff like that. So you mentioned a lawsuit was a possibility. How likely would that be? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, Tom, when I asked Tom Ryan, he's you know couldn't really put a percentage on it. Said it's something we're considering. You know. Potentially, you know, he's going to be filing this complaint with the Secretary of State's office and the Clean Elections Commission, so potentially this might just be to try and ensure that records and information are preserved for this complaint, not necessarily for the lawsuit, but I guess time will tell on that. And I was going to say, filing those complaints with the Secretary of State and Clean Elections, that's pretty much a done deal. Um, so they say, we've been waiting for this for uh, a few days now. It's supposed to be, you know, every day it's supposed to be, well, tomorrow, then yes. the next day, well, tomorrow, the next day, well, tomorrow. So it's supposed to be today, it's supposed to be yesterday, and now they say probably tomorrow, so <laughs> we'll so, see. So what is Tom Horn's response to all this, or what is the Attorney General's office? What, what is the response to all of this? Well, when I spoke with them on Monday, they hadn't seen this yet. They said they're not going to really respond to, the to this. They want to see what's in the complaint. They took some shots at Sarah Beatty's credibility, saying that she'd had some issues with former employers. In terms of the kind of nuts and bolts of this, the, the issue over AG's office employees electioneering on um, 
you know, taxpayer time, those allegations, those have been around for a while. You know, Horn doesn't have a campaign spokesperson per se. He's uh, had, uh, you know, Brett Meekham and uh, the official office spokeswoman for a while, Stephanie Grisham, doing some of that work. Uh, Grisham's no longer doing that now, but they'd been serving as the spokespeople. When you talk to them, they try to emphasize, oh, well, I'm on a break right now. Um, which you saw a video on uh, Channel 12 just a few days ago that they obtained of uh, Brett Meekham and, Ste and uh, Sarah Beatty dropping off a campaign-related complaint to the Secretary of State's office, not from Horn, but from some of his allies. Uh, filing a complaint against a group that's opposing Tom Horn. This was during the workday, they say during the lunch break. Yeah. So, uh, and it sounds like, again, from the stories in front of a reading here, there are other claims of staffers at work on his campaign. This is not just a single incident, maybe not even just a single person. No, there's, um, if you looked at, look at his uh, last uh, campaign finance report that cover, goes through the end of 2013, there were about seven attorney general's office employees who'd been reimbursed by the campaign for various campaign related expenses. You know, a couple of those, those people had been volunteering their time for, uh, to be the campaign spokesperson. Sarah Beatty, of course, was volunteering her time to do the uh, fundraising stuff. So there's a few people there, mostly within uh, Horn's inner circle, who are assisting, giving a lot of assistance to his campaign. You know, it seems like uh, Tom Horn has a lot going on uh, for a variety of reasons. So how many legal plates does he have spinning right now? <laughs> Uh, there's a number of them. We're still kind of waiting to see how the campaign finance allegations play out. The kind of the the first domino to fall, really. Uh, you know, an administrative law judge said, you know, basically uh, more or less exonerated him. Said there's not enough evidence to show that any laws were broken. Recommended this these charges be dismissed. Uh, Yavapai County attorney, attorney Sheila Polk still has another week or so to decide whether or not she's going to accept that. She can push forward with the case either way. Mm -hmm. And you know, if she accepts it, then we'll end up in superior court with that. If not, um, I I guess that's the end of that. Uh, there was another lawsuit from a former employee who alleged retaliation for political reasons. That was settled uh, out of court for about $100,000. Um, the infamous hit and run incident in the parking garage, that's been settled. So there are fewer plates in the air than there used to be, but uh, the memory lingers on, I think, for uh, certainly for his uh, opponents. And we want to make it clear, as far as, as the Attorney General's office and, and Tom Horn, there is a firm denial of these accusations. Yes, they say that you know, Horn and the office say that uh, the employers are not doing any campaign work on state time. They're doing during breaks. They're you know not on taxpayer time, and um, you know that may be put them in the clear if that's the case. There's still some questions about that. Uh, not too long ago, the office uh, itself to its employees put out a uh, kind of a seven-page guideline on this kind of thing, and there was a mention in there of. You know, you have to take leave. Do not commingle. Mm -hmm. You know these act. You know campaign and political activities with your official duties during the workday. So it's kind of a gray area. All right, Jeremy. Good stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ed. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. A new report by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities shows that for the past six years, Arizona leads the nation in cuts to state aid to higher education. The report also shows that during those same six years, Arizona had the highest tuition increase in the country. Joining us now is Arizona Board of Regents President Eileen Klein. It's good to see you again. Thank Thanks. you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's, let's get to these numbers quickly and then where we can go from these okay. numbers. Tops in, in cuts to state aid, I think the actual dollar amount ranks maybe 10th, but in terms of a percentage rank, that's not very, uh, that's not very good. Right, tough times for sure. So while the report's new, the news is not. 
and Arizona's universities were in fact among the hardest hit. So in a way it's not a surprise in the sense that our state was among the hardest hit of all states during the recession. But it's produced some really challenging circumstances for our universities. So it resulted in about $400 million worth of cuts to our universities, most of which unfortunately had to be made up by tuition increases. Indeed, and that's where we get to the tuition increases, right. the highest in the country, and that actual dollars ranks number one there as well. Right. Um, for those watching right now, either paying tuition in one way, shape, or form, what do they take from this? What, what, is this going to change soon? The dynamic seems very problematic for those who are really concerned about right. this. Right, so it's challenging and certainly affordability is a big issue for our families. Incomes, you know, we realize are not increasing that quickly. But the reality is that there has not been replacement revenue really by either the federal government or the state government. So whereas before the recession, the state was our primary funder, today the state only provides about one third of the total dollars for our universities. And as a result, families have had to make up the difference. On top of that, our university student population grew by about 23,000 students during the same period. So all the way around, universities needed to find more resources, tuition being one of them, other partnerships needed to be another, and we were really forced to change our business model. Talk about that change, because we've, we've had those discussions right. on this program before. If state A, if we have a new normal here, which <laughs> may be in fact happening, how do we change? Where do we go? Right, so the universities obviously needed to think about their own priorities. Reductions were made, there certainly were layoffs, but at the same time, we tried to think about how we could make our offerings more affordable. So we used more online technology, we bought brought programs into local communities like in Lake Havasu. We tried to augment our partnerships with community colleges. Today we have over 1,200 partnerships with community colleges in our state, all of which were designed to offer not only more local offerings, but offerings at a more affordable price point. But for the long term, truly something has to give. We're concerned that Students can't necessarily pay the increasing tuition. When we look at the K-12 pipeline, students are going to have greater financial need, which makes that even more difficult. We don't know how long federal aid's going to hold out around Pell Grants. So ultimately, we're in a conversation now with our policymakers about where do we go from here so we can make sure college stays affordable. Talk about that conversation. What's being said? Right, so the good news is in the past two years, and remember this report is several, it's compiling mm -hmm. information that's several years old, and in the past two years, the legislature has begun to add back money. So we've recovered about $90 million total, so nowhere near what we had before in terms of support, but certainly it's helpful in terms of aid to our universities. But overall, we need to start talking about how we fund our universities. We're trying to change our funding model. The old growth model didn't work. The state could not afford it. And so we're trying to really work with our legislature on funding us around performance. So as we contribute to the Arizona economy, whether it's for new graduates or research contributions, that the state begins to add back to our, to our base budget so that we can continue to keep prices low that college can be affordable and accessible, but also that we can be effective because we need to be providing quality offerings as well. Indeed, and I know that some lawmakers, uh, we've had these discussions on the program before, don't see necessarily the need for a research university, just <laughs> teach the read and write and arithmetic at the higher level well, and move on, that sort of thing. How do you work that dynamic into the conversation? Right, so the, the universities occupy a very, a very special place in, in terms of our economy, and that is we don't just impart knowledge, we produce knowledge, and our businesses count on us, producing graduates who know the latest, that they are ready to go to work, and also that they're ready to develop new technologies and deploy new skills in the workplace. And so universities are really at the forefront of that knowledge creation and knowledge transfer, transfer into the private sector. That's why you hear companies saying that they choose to locate near one of our universities because they want to be near the talent and access really to the resources that the university provides in terms of research capability. And we also need the state's help with that. So the universities are looking to really double their research capacity by 2020, and that's going to take a pretty significant commitment in terms of infrastructure for buildings, for technology, and it is really important. Our business community recognizes they've stepped up greatly to support that effort because they know it's essential to drive the economy in the future. I was gonna say, how do you get that message across? Is it right. by way of the business community saying, if X, then Y? I mean, how do you do this? Because again, you know what it's like down there at the legislature. <laughs> there are folks who simply don't wanna spend 
what some say needs to be spent. And so, and I appreciate their efforts to make sure that our state stays strong because to be sure, no business wants to be here if we don't have a strong financial condition for our state. But at the same time, companies want to be here because they know they can get the talent they need to run their businesses. So we've heard repeatedly from business groups, we need you to produce more high qualified workers for us, particularly in technology-based fields. And we're trying to respond to that. And I think we're responding to that well, but it can't happen without a true partnership with the state and that's the model we're trying to evolve. So with, with parents watching right now, with students watching right now and in the rearview mirror they see number one in terms of cuts in state aid, number one in terms of tuition increase. Right. If they want to get away from the rearview mirror and start looking <laughs> through the windshield, what are you telling them? What, 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 what is the optimism or what is the hope here? Right. Well, first, thanks for choosing higher education. It's still the best bet for your own future, and it's becoming increasingly the ticket you need to get to the middle class in our society. But the truth is we're doing more to also make sure our, our costs are more predictable for families. So we have implemented now, in one form or fashion, a tuition predictability or guarantee plan. So families know coming through the door what it's going to cost them. Students can do the calculations. And then we have caps in place at two of our three universities to make sure that the costs don't exceed that so they know they can afford the tuition long term. And what about student aid? Where do we stand on and that? Student aid. So long term, our state really does need to get very very serious about how we're going to support students. As I mentioned, our students are going to be more financially needy, and we are unlike other states where they have very significant student based, state based financial aid for students. We need to develop that. That's going to be a longer term play for us, but one that we're, that we're eager to talk to legislators about, and they do understand those needs. For them, it's a matter of trying to figure out how to juggle those priorities. But that will be essential for us going forward. And also, we're trying to work with our students on their own money management skills. So we're experimenting with some programs like Arizona Earn to Learn, where students get foundational information and financial literacy so that they know how to manage their own funds, that they take loans that are truly for their education and not for their lifestyle. And so all of these factors come into play. We are, we're proud our students graduate with less debt than students do nationally, but ultimately we know we have to make sure that they don't leave college with a mountain of debt. Last question before you go. This report said that all these numbers, these are all policy choices. And you've been on both sides of this particular. <laughs> I, you, you, I have. Very high in the governor's office, now president of the Board of Regents, very high on both levels. Is it a good thing that states are not majority stakeholders in terms of policy? So it, it, it's a challenge. So we certainly are public institutions. We operate in the public interest. But more and more, we're going to need more private sector solutions, whether it's partnerships or new ways of creating a financing model. So what we're looking to do is making sure that we work with our policymakers going forward on creating the very, the, really the most modern university system that we can create with enough freedom and flexibility so that we can get the resources we need to serve the public. And at the same time, though, we want to make sure the state stays committed. Their support's important, and it needs to continue. All right, very good to see you again. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much. Us. Tonight's focus on sustainability looks at an environmental report card for the governor and the legislature, courtesy of the Arizona chapter of the Sierra Club. Sandy Barr is a director of the Sierra Club's Grand Canyon chapter. She joins us now. Good to see you again. It's great to see you. Uh, an environmental report card, what does that exactly look at? Does it look at what's being done, what's not being done, or both? Well, it mostly looks at the bills that they voted on. We, what we try to do is 
evaluate legislators and the governor on the same bills. So we're, we're not uh, bringing subjectivity into it too much. You know, it's, it's how did you vote? Did you vote yes or no on a bill that was uh, positive for the environment? Did you vote yes or no on a uh, bill that was bad for the environment? And we had all 36 Republicans in the House with failing grades, all but three or four Republicans in the Senate with failing grades. Any Democrats with failing grades? Uh, no Democrats with failing grades, a couple with low grades. Uh, it's one of the really disturbing trends we've seen in, in you know, the last several years is that environmental protection has started to become partisan when it shouldn't be. And so the Republican caucus down at the legislature uh, really has been voting against environmental protection. This session, uh, they passed bills to hinder wolf recovery. Uh, they passed bills that would have allowed uh, illegal bulldozing in wilderness areas. They uh, you know, passed bills to make it more difficult to do uh, citizen initiatives. There, so there were a lot of really awful bills that they moved forward. And to be honest with you, very little that will be helpful from an environmental perspective. In the past, was it always this partisan? No, no. Um, I've been doing this for about 20 years now, and uh, it, w it was not. There was always a core group of uh, Republicans who were working for conservation and who got A's on our report card. And, and so that's why it's, it's disturbing that it's this way. We're hoping to see that shift uh, back to where there really is bipartisan support for it. I mean, clean air should not be a partisan issue. Protecting wildlife shouldn't be partisan. Making sure people uh, uh, save money on their utility bills, that shouldn't be partisan. The governor did not get a failing grade. In fact, you got a C-plus grade. Why? Uh, well, she stepped up and vetoed three terrible bills, and we gave her credit for that. She, uh, she vetoed two bills that were aimed at uh, making it more difficult for uh, Mexican gray wolves to recover. And uh, she recognized that there were already mechanisms for addressing uh, issues that livestock interests have relative to wolf recovery. Uh, she recognized that there were some constitutional issues too because we're talking about the Federal Endangered Species right. Act and, right. and uh, the wolf is a listed species. And then uh, she also vetoed uh, the, the bill that would have allowed for taking any equipment into protected areas uh, under the guise of an emergency. Again, she said, look, there's already a way to deal with these issues. You know, I, I, I think basically saying these were over the top, anti-federal government, anti-environmental protection measures, uh, you, you know, you've gone too far. And there was some funding found for state parks, correct? Yeah, a, 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 a little bill to uh, promote a checkoff on the uh, state income tax for state parks. It's, it's not huge, but it's something. And the first year in a while where we saw a bill specifically for parks that was positive, so uh, we, we welcome that, and she also signed that. You mentioned clean energy and energy efficiency programs and such. I think most of us, we drive around, if you live anywhere near an ASU campus, you see nothing but these, these solar panels all over the place. And you see solar farms and this sort of thing. It seems like the state is taking some sort of action in that direction. Is, is the legislature simply not addressing clean energy like you'd like to see, solar energy in particular? Are we missing something here? What's going on? Well, first of all, a lot of the energy uh, rules um, are adopted by the Arizona Corporation Commission. And, and so our renewable energy standard sure. and our energy efficiency standard, uh, those were adopted under previous commissions. And so, uh, so that's why you see a lot of what you see. But um, what the legislature is doing is, um, at the city level, we're also seeing some positive measures. Mm -hmm. Cities are stepping up to adopt uh, energy efficient building codes. So when homes are built, uh, they're more efficient and, and you use a lot of le less electricity, they're more comfortable, what's not to like? Well, um, certain uh, interests, including the home builders of central Arizona, don't like that cities are doing that. And so they come to the legislature and try to get the legislature to remove the authority of cities, counties, local government uh, to make those kinds of policies. And so instead of adopting policies to further efficiency, 
we were fighting all session to keep them from undermining it. We got about 30 seconds left. How many bills were changed this session to address your concerns? Well, there were um, probably uh, four or five bills that were changed, and there were some that uh, passed out of one house but did not advance when they went to the other house, partly because of environmental concerns. There, you know, it's not that there aren't uh, a lot of people who care about environmental protection at the legislature. Unfortunately, they're not the loudest voices, and they can't always get a, a majority vote. Well, it's an interesting report card. Uh, good information. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And Thursday on Arizona Horizon, celebrated physicist Lawrence Krauss gives us his monthly update on the latest science news. And a former apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright talks about his new book on the famed architect. That's Thursday evening, 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. The Global Institute of Sustainability is the heart of ASU's sustainability initiatives, advancing research, education, and business practices for an urbanizing world. Learn more about ASU sustainability at sustainability.asu.edu/tv.